So, uh, welcome to the first session of this year's QIP, which is also the first plenary talk featuring the best pa best student paper. And I want to mention that the uh, the award will be presented on Thursday, and the conference dinner, I believe, on oh, Wednesday. Sorry, on Wednesday and the conference dinner, I believe. And just okay. Now here we go. So this talk will be about a very cool cryptographic primitive called homomorphic encryption for quantum data. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the most exciting advances in quantum cryptography in the past year. And this work was done by folks from University of Amsterdam, Yves K. Dulek, Christian Schaffner, and Florian Spielman. And I will be presenting this work, just to let you know. Well, I wish I could. The authors wouldn't be happy. So uh, actually, Florian will be our speaker. And this talk itself will be 50 minutes. And after that, you have a few minutes for questions. And let's, uh, let's welcome Florian. Right. So thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So, OK, so I will be talking about quantum homomorphic encryption. With co my co-authors are, are Ivka, who is pictured there on the left, and Chris, who is pictured there on the right. Uh, Chris is also present here at QIP. And they are uh, researchers in Amsterdam. And for most of this work, I was also a PhD student in Amsterdam, although I, recently I started a postdoc in, in Copenhagen. All right, so what is homomorphic encryption? Um, we will have the same protagonist we often have, namely Alice. And Alice is, uh, is on holidays. And on her holidays, she sees many interesting things. For example, she takes a photo of a, of a coffee shop. I, uh, so this is, for example, the original Starbucks. And she takes a photo of some other interesting landmark. And now, when she, when she gets home, she might want to categorize these photos. So she might want to uh, tag them. So maybe she wants to write, for the first photo, she wants to write cafe. And for the second, she wants to write space needle. But uh, you know, now she only took two photos. But maybe she has a huge album. And it's, it's a lot of work to tag them all. So she might want some help. But on her travels, she also encounters uh, a friendly cloud. So this, this cloud says, I have a computer. I have some spare processing power. I have servers in my, you know, floating around somewhere. And I can help you tag these photos. I have a sophisticated tagging algorithm that I trained on huge data sets. Uh, so, you know, just send me the photos and I'll, I'll give them tags. But Alice is a little bit suspicious because she doesn't just want to send off her photos to some you know, some talking cloud. She, she doesn't know what his motivations are exactly. So actually, she's going to do something a bit more sophisticated than just send off these photos. Uh, she's going to encrypt these photos. And then she's going to send these encrypted photos off to the cloud. And now the, the kind of magic trick about quantum homomorphic encryption is that now this cloud computer is able to perform a, a computation on these encrypted photos without decrypting them in the meantime. So from the perspective of this cloud, these, photo, these data will always be encrypted. So it starts just, you know, from the perspective of the cloud, it, cloud, it looks like a mess. It looks encrypted. And then he, he can still perform a computation and get encrypted outcome. And now he can send back this encrypted outcome, which can be uh, decrypted by Alice so she can you know, get the, the information that she wanted. Uh, so, you know, this uh, can help a lot, right? So now the, now the privacy of Alice is, uh, is safe. And actually, for a long time, uh, cryptographers would really, uh, really wanted to do this, but they didn't know how. So people thought maybe it's even impossible. But in a breakthrough result in 2009, uh, Gentry proposed a protocol or, or came up with a protocol which which does this for classical data. And of course, here we're at QIP, so we would like to think, you know, what happens if instead of Alice taking photos, she, uh, you know, she takes quantum photos, or she has some quantum, uh, quantum data, 
and she would like to send off this quantum data to to some cloud computer, some other server, and would like, you know, would like this server should be able to do computations on this data without compromising Alice's privacy. So, and this talk is about the quantum case of, of this problem. So first, I'll, I'll spend some time being a bit more careful to define you know, what, what is a homomorphic encryption scheme and what do we want out of it. Then I'll present some, some basic uh, proposals that don't quite work. And then, of course, I'll, I'll say what we have to do to extend this to, to come up with a better scheme. So uh, just as a basic thing, what are the ingredients of a homomorphic encryption scheme? So of course, if you have an encryption scheme, you will have some key generation protocol. So Alice will have her computer generate, say, a public key, uh, which, which can be used to encrypt data, a secret key, which can be used to decrypt, and some, other, and some extra data, which, uh, which is there for technical reasons, which is called an evaluation key. Now, encryption just means she takes the public key, takes her data, say the photograph, and encrypts it. And of course, we would like some notion of security. So from the perspective of someone that doesn't know any key, this should look completely, or this should look completely indistinguishable from some other photo or maybe even a black picture. So you shouldn't be able to learn anything about, about the data. And what makes homomorphic encryption special is this evaluation procedure, so, which is run by the cloud computer in this case. Uh, so the evaluation procedure takes some encrypted data, uh, the evaluation key, and some computer program that you want to run. So it might be the proprietary image tagging algorithm from the, from the cloud computer. And take those together and then produce the encrypted output. And of course, there's a decryption algorithm that takes the private key uh, and the encrypted data and, and gets back the results. So the Alice should also be able to get it back. And of course, this should work for any general classical data. So you should, should give, uh, you know, so if, if we just talk about some data X and then we want to run some program on this data X, say a computer program or a Turing machine, a circuit, and now about, uh, and so this was the case that was solved. And in the quantum case, we want to do something similar, right? So Alice has now some quantum state psi. I will just talk about pure states, but of course there's no reason why, why it all should be pure states, just to make the notation simpler. And then, and then this evaluation key, in our case, we also allow it to be quantum. So then we, uh, we have some more technical tricks we can use if this evaluation key is quantum. And now instead of some function we want to apply, we, we just say we would like the scheme to apply some unitary. All right, so what has been done before? Or at least look at, let's look at some things that we can try. So first, let's think about some, some trivial things we, we may be able to try. So, and then just see you know, what, what do we want out of a scheme. So let's say the most silly scheme possible Alice just takes her input, sends it off, and then asks the computation to be performed. Of course, this is not encryption, but, uh, you know, but this is homomor the homomorphic property that we want out of the scheme uh, you know, is satisfied. And there will also be some other property called compactness that I will explain in a minute. But of course, this scheme is not secure at all, right? Alice, Alice your data is just in the public. So we might think, well, let's just encrypt this data in some way, and let's see what we can do there. So the most basic encryption scheme for quantum data is the quantum one-time pad, which is a quantum analog of the, of the classical one-time pad. And, it's, uh, and it basically works as follows. You pick a random classical data, and the two classical bits, and then depending on these classical bits, apply a Pauli to uh, the quantum state. So for example, this, like if Alice would just encrypt your data, send it off, then it's secure again, but now we have no idea how to perform a computation on, on data which is encrypted with a one-time pad. So of course, this also won't work. And there's also a slightly more interesting trivial scheme which, which doesn't work that we can try. And that is we encrypt the data with a one-time pad, send it off, and then the cloud computer just says, 
I'll just append my program code to this, uh, to this encrypted data, send it back, and now we define our decryption procedure as first decrypted data and then run this program. Of course, this is a very silly thing to do, but, uh, but there's this other uh, requirement of the scheme that we have, which is called compactness, and it means that the decryption procedure should be equally hard no matter what circuit is applied to this data. So this kind of trivial scheme breaks that property because you know, if the server would append a very long circuit and ask, to ask the decryption procedure to apply that, then of course the decryption procedure would take a very long time. So these are the things that, don't, you know, that we don't want out of a scheme and we want to come up with a scheme that, uh, that's good in all these respects. So uh, it is actually possible to build a nice scheme uh, without too much effort for a limited class of circuits called uh, the Clifford circuits. So, uh, so earlier work uh, came up with a scheme for this. And here we, so the Clifford circuits are like a subset of all quantum computations. And uh, well, here instead of perfect security, like for the one time bed, it will be computational security, but I'll explain what I mean with that yeah, in a second. So what are these Clifford circuits? So the Clifford group, is, are just those quantum operations generated by applying the Hadamard gates, the phase gates, and the C knots. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these circuits have very nice properties, but the one that we care about right now is that uh, applying these gates uh, map Pauli operators to Pauli operators. The commutation rules for these, these operations work very nicely with the Pauli. So for, for example, uh, Hadamard times a Pauli X equals a Z, time, Z gate times a Hadamard. I'm just ignoring global phases for now because we're, we're just applying everything as gates, so we don't care about, about phases. There, there will be some, some minus signs in these, uh, in these relations, actually. And it's the same for, for, for example, the phase gate and also for the C naught gate. Now it's, uh, for example, the C naught applied to X tensor I kind of copies the, the Pauli X to the other bit. From the, from the control bit to the target. So it doesn't really matter what these rules are, it just matters for our case that, it, that they exist. There is some simple way of, of you know, if we have a computation, swapping the order of a Pauli and a Clifford gate. But of course, uh, the Clifford gates do not form a universal gate set. So for example, it, uh, the circuits just consisting of these gates can be efficiently simulated classically. Uh, but also just by counting, you can see there's way fewer of these than, than there are of, uh, of general quantum unitaries. All right, but let's now see what, what to do to build a scheme for just these gates. So our ingredient one will be the quantum one-time pad again. So uh, our encryption, like we've seen before, is we pick two classical bits, and I'll just write them with like an icon to remind us that uh, with a key that these are, this is the key for the one-time pad. And then we use these classical bits to apply, a Pauli, apply the Pauli to the, to the bit we want, the qubit we want to encrypt. And I'll, I'll write a lock to, to remind us that these Paulis really represent an encryption. And then decryption is just applying the same Paulis again to uh, get rid of them. And our second ingredient will be to use classical homomorphic encryption. So we can just use it as a black box for this scheme, but you can just think of the, of the schemes that actually exist. So there are schemes that, that do classical homomorphic encryption, and now we're kind of going to bootstrap them to do quantum homomorphic encryption for some gates. All right, so first let's see what happens if Alice would take her input qubit psi, uh, encrypt it with a one-time pad, and then send it off to the cloud. And now just as an example, let's see what happens if the cloud wants to apply a Hadamard gate. So if the cloud applies the Hadamard gate, actually what comes out because of these commutation rules is uh, Hadamard applied to the state with a valid quantum one-time pad. But the problem here is that the key to the one-time pad is not the same as before. So it used to be the key AB, but now it's the key BA and we can just you can just see this by applying these rules we saw earlier. Uh, so the X and the Z swap, swap value. And the same thing happens if we apply 
uh, the P gates or the C nodes, the, the, we still end up with a valid encryption of the, of the state, but now with a key that is wrong. So to fix this, we're going to use the second ingredient. So after Alice encrypts this qubit using the quantum mounting pad, uh, she's now going to use the classical homomorphic encryption scheme to also encrypt these two bits that define the quantum mounting pad. So this red thing is just classical data, uh, just a classical bit string in, in Alice's, her normal laptop, her normal computer. And this blue thing is a, a single quantum bit. And now if she sends both of those off to, uh, to the cloud, he can, you know, again as before, just apply the Hadamard to the quantum bit. So he just applies the Clifford to the, to the qubit. But he can use this classical homomorphic encryption scheme uh, to now also afterwards update this encrypted key of the one-time pad. So it's still secure because he doesn't, you know, from the perspective of the cloud, he just sees encrypted data. But he can use the homomorphic encryption scheme to update it in the correct way. And now if, when he sends it back to Alice, Alice can first use the key of the classical encryption scheme to get back this one-time pad and see, uh, you know, to get back the updated one-time pad and then use this updated one time pad to actually get back the results of this computation. And now I just did only one qubit examples, but just let's quickly go through like a two qubit gate because it's a little bit more complicated, but not much. So if Alice has a two qubit psi, she can you know, use a quantum one time pad on both of the qubits. Uh, so which is just, you know, just applying them separately on either qubit. And then she can also, you know, encrypt the, the keys to this, these two one-time pads, send those off, and now the update rule associated to the C uh, is maybe a little bit more complicated than Hadamard, but it's still quite simple. It's just performing a binary XOR of, of one thing with, you know, one thing with, with one other thing. So, you know, this is a computation that can easily be handled by a classical homomorphic encryption scheme. So we can use that to update. And uh, the important thing here is that uh, now the computer can just continue, the cloud computer can continue this because the form of this data, it's, you know, he started with classical encrypted uh, one-time pad and a quantum state with a quantum one-time pad. Uh, and after this computation step, it's again in the same form. So he can just apply this next Clifford gate without any interaction with Alice and he can just continue this indefinitely. So this form, having an encrypted uh, one-time pad and having a quantum state encrypted with, the, with that one-time pad, this will be kind of an invariant that, that we will always try to maintain. Uh, and if we have maintained this invariant, we can then go on to, to perform a next gate. Right, but this Clifford scheme, the Clifford, uh, Clifford circuits are not universal. So we're going to have to add some gate to make it universal. And a very popular choice of, uh, to do this is the T gate because so actually it's possible to add pretty much any gate to, uh, you know, to this gate set to make it universal. But the T gate has some nice properties of its own which makes it a very appealing choice. And actually it has a very simple form. It's just, it's just this diagonal, uh, diagonal matrix. And the commutation rules, so because it's diagonal it just commutes with the Z. But when we look at t times x, that equals the phase gate times x times t. So, so this is no longer the same form of commutation rule as we had with the, with the Clifford group, because now there's this extra p gate, which is not a Pauli. So for example, if we, if we, now to, if we would just try to apply this t gate to uh, something which is encrypted with a one-time pad, then if the one-time pad x x part happens to be zero, then actually this T gate works, works fine because you just input it and then the output is just the T gate applied to the data. But if the x part happens to be one, then there's this extra phase gate. And this phase gate is from our perspective an error because now we no longer have this invariant that we just have our data encrypted with a quantum one time pad, we have some extra, extra gate that may or not, may not be present. And the, the cloud computer also doesn't know whether it's present or not because he actually doesn't know this, 
you know, this first bit of the, of the one-time pad. So if this first bit of the one-time pad, we'll just call it A, as you know, we'll just call them A, B, so we'll just call it A. He doesn't know that how to apply a correction only if this bit equals one. And earlier work, I'll try to get around this problem of the T-gates uh, in different ways. So, uh, so this was the Clifford scheme, and actually the fact that I wrote computational security just comes from the fact that we use a classical homomorphic encryption scheme, and uh, the security of the classical homomorphic encryption scheme is based on computational assumptions, so that's why the, the quantum scheme is also based on exactly the same computational assumptions. All right, but so the other, uh, the earlier work that tried to get rid of this, this unwanted phase gate or try to handle the T gate in some good way, uh, was able to do it, but then with a blow up which scaled badly with the number of T gates. So for example, uh, work by Broadbent and Jeffrey was able to handle quantum circuits with a constant T depth because the, the the size of the encryption scaled exponentially in the number of, in the layers of T gates. Or they also proposed a different scheme where the, the complexity of the decryption function scaled with the number of T gates, which made it kind of in between actual compact and for some circuits and not quite compact for, for others. And there was also work by uh, Wu Yang, Tan, and Fitzsimmons that was. Now, where the security notion was a little bit different, so they had information theoretic security instead of computational uh, assumptions that were needed, but that could also only handle uh, circuits with a constant number of T gates. So the scheme I'm going to present now uh, will actually be able to handle quantum circuits of polynomial size. So, I, uh, so the work we do will still scale in some sense with the number of T gates, but now it scales linearly, so we can actually handle all the uh, all polynomial size circuits, again with computational assumptions. All right, so now to present the, the new scheme. So we're going to build some gadget, we'll call it, that is able to correct this error that we don't want. So remember that uh, the, uh, so Alice is going to build this gadget when she uh, generates the key. And then this gadget is able to take a qubit that might have a P gate applied to it or not, and then remove it if it's present. And then also, you know, this will also involve updating the, cl the classical key in some case. Uh, and from the perspective of the cloud, just remember that the cloud doesn't know this bit A. He doesn't know whether to apply this P gate or not, and he will be the one that has to do it because he's the one that's performed the computation. But uh, he does have an encrypted version of this bit A. So basically what he's, so, so just remember that this bit A equals the decryption, where decryption is an actual computation of, you know, and this decryption depends on the private key and this data that the cloud has. So properties of this, uh, of this gadget will be, so it, it should be efficiently constructible, of course. And, uh, and it will be, unfortunately, destroyed every single use. So we're going to have to use a gadget for every T-gate, but just a, just a single one. All right, so now we're going to need some uh, ingredient from theoretical computer science, uh, from complexity theory, which is called Barrington's theorem. Uh, so we're going to take a small excursion and then apply it back to see how we can use it to construct this gadget. And the main object in Barrington's theorem now is called a permutation branching program. And it's uh, a very simple model of computation. So we have some Boolean function f uh, that, we're, that we want to compute. And we're going to compute it using a list of instructions. So a program is just a list of instructions, and the instructions consist of three parts. Um, it consists of uh, a label of a bit. So for example, the first label is xi, so it just means go to the x input and look at the i-th bit. And if this i-th bit is uh, equals zero, then this instruction, instruction evaluates to pi, the first part. Uh, and if it's one, it evaluates to sigma. I'll, I'll say what pi and sigma are in a minute. So, so that's just what happens. We look at the input and then just look at a single bit at a time and then evaluate to either pi or sigma. And this pi or sigma 
which you might guess from the name permutation benching programs, are permutations. So they're just permutations in our case of five elements. So elements of, of S5, the symmetric group of five elements. And um, after evaluating all these instructions, we say that the output of a program is just applying all these permutations one after the other, just the, just the normal group multiplication of the, of the permutations. And then how does this, you know, this, this program compute a function? We say that if this multiplication is the identity permutation, so if everything is back where it started, then, uh, then the function equals zero. And if it's some other fixed cycle, then the function equals one. And so I'll give an example of what such a, such a, of such a program in a second. Uh, and we say that the length of a program is just the number of instructions. So for example, let's say we, we have a permutation branching program of the OR function. So we know I've, we've all, all seen the OR function. It's one if x equals one or y equals one. And we can actually do it with the length four program. So the first instruction look at, looks at the bit x, and then either, is the, uh, either evaluates to a cycle which maps one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, and five to one. And, other, and if the bit equals one, it evaluates to identity. And then it looks at a bit of y and uh, evaluates to either the cycle or the identity. It looks at x again, and it looks at y again. So you, maybe we have to exit the same bit multiple times. But we just look at x, y, x, y. So for example, if we fill in 0, 0, you know, first we get then uh, you know, this, this simple cycle. Then the second instruction looks at y, sees at 0, gets this other cycle. Then we look at the first bit again, get the cycle. And then we look at the second bit and get this other cycle. And now, you know, of course, it's not easy to see instantly if, to track all these you know, this graphical representation of the permutations, but I colored one to make it a bit easier. And you can actually see that, you know, we started, you know, if you follow one maps first to two, then to four, then to three, then to one again. So, and, you know, the other elements also map to itself. So this is actually the identity permutation. And like we agreed before, this means the function equals zero. But we can also, you know, look at the other inputs, for example, uh, x equals zero, y equals one. So then we evaluate the instructions again. But now, you know, now the y instructions evaluate to the second part. And now if we track this, we see that actually it's not the identity. But now, you know, we have that one maps to four, like, like we say here, and, and et cetera. We map to some fixed cycle. And we, you know, we can continue following for the, for the other two options. And see, uh, you know, if you just track, track what happens, uh, you see that this, this branching program, even though it's a very simple object, can compute this function or. Well, now you might be curious what's, you know, what's the power of these, uh, of these branching programs, these permutation branching programs. What can they do? And actually, so a classic result from, uh, from computer science is Berenson's theorem, which was very surprising at the time. And it said that uh, you know, these branching programs are just uh, introduced of polynomial length can compute all functions in the function class NC1. So I, I drew here some complexity classes. So the biggest one is NP that we all know. And below that is P, polynomial time computation. So this L here is computation that only have logarithmic space memory. And NC1, the function class I'm talking about, is still a bit smaller. Namely, it's logarithmic depth circuits. But it doesn't really matter what it is for us right now. But what mostly matters is it's like a non-trivial class of functions. It actually does have interesting computations. And one of the interesting computations it has is actually decryption functions of all known classical homomorphic encryption schemes. Uh, and actually, the, the uh, designers of these classical homomorphic encryption schemes really like their decryption functions to be in NC1 for for different technical reasons, but for us, it now also helps a lot because we now will be able to apply Berenson's theorem to these decryption functions. Uh, right, so just remember what we were trying to do. We're going to go back to the gadget. Now we, now we know Berenson's theorem. 
So we want to build this gadget that applies an inverse phase gate if this bit equals one. And now we have this, you know, we know that this decrypt function has a polynomial size branching program. So we go, we're now going to build this gadget that takes away the phase gate if it's present. All right, so now just first as an overview, what will, be, what will we put in this gadget? So, uh, you know, and how do we, uh, what do we do with the qubit when we want to use it? All right, the gadget will consist of a few parts. So the first part will, we will construct out of the permutation branching program of the decrypt function. So remember that this decrypt function, uh, so if this, this decrypt function on, if we run it on the private key and the encryption of this bit A, then if it's zero, we don't want to apply a phase gate, an inverse phase gate, and if it's one, we do want to apply a, an inverse phase gate. But it being zero means that this permutation branching program gives the identity permutation. So we're actually going to, you know, in some way uh, represent this, these paths in our gadget and then, uh, you know, say use the first element of this path. And then this first element of the path will be linked to the first element of the output if the bit A equals zero. So we're going to, uh, so, so we're going to uh, let the qubit trace a path through this thing using teleportation, and this, uh, you know, and the, and the path will will go past past the first thing if we don't need to apply this correction, and it will go past one of the others if we do need to apply one. Uh, and then, if, you know, just for technical reasons, we want to. Also extract this qubit from this gadget afterwards somehow, so we're go also going to reverse all these steps and go back to the, so we can exit our, our gadget. So I, I'll, I'll of course explain what, what I mean with actually, you know, going through it, because of course, it, you know, that doesn't mean anything, but I, I will explain how we go through it. So, but for example, in this, this case, we didn't need to apply a correction, so the path will not go through one of the inverse phase gates. But you know, for some other some other value of this encrypted A, this permutation branching program will make sure that we do go past one of the inverse phase gates. All right. So now, what do I mean? Like, if qubit follows a path through such a uh, permutation branching program, so actually we're going to use uh, teleportation to do that. So, so this is the branching program for this decrypt function, and remember that you know how these things are linked up depends alternately, or we can just without the loss of generality assume it's alternately, depends on a bit of the, the key, of the, the key that, that Alice actually has, and then it will depend on a bit of this encryption of A, the thing that the cloud computer has and that he wants to decrypt in some way to you know, know whether or to apply this correction or not. And Alice will now, uh, Create EPR pairs depending on these permutations. So she will, so for all these permutations, she will look at her bit, uh, and if it's zero, she will produce five EPR pairs permuted in, in the way you know according to pi, or and if it's one, she will you know create five EPR pairs, depend uh, permuted according to sigma, and then when we're going to use this gadget as a cloud, he will look at. You know, he will look at his bits of this encrypted A and then perform teleportation measurements, so bell measurements, on the things that Alice will have given him. So just uh, uh, to recap, so Alice is going to one by one uh, create these EPR pairs. So she is going to look at her, at her key create EPR pairs linked up according to this branching program. And now, uh, and of course, uh, you know, for bookkeeping purposes, she also needs to encrypt the structure with the classical homomorphic encryption scheme. And now she sends all of this off to the cloud. And now the cloud is, uh, you know, received this this gadget. And when he wants to use it, he has his uh, qubit he wants to uh, he wants to apply the correction to, and he has his classical information. And now, depending on this classical information. We will teleport his qubit, you know, first he will perform a teleportation measurement between his qubit and 
say, the first uh, EPR half that Alice sent. But afterwards, he will look at, uh, you know, he will evaluate the permutation branching program instructions on his inputs, you know, the ones that he can evaluate, uh, get this permutation back, using this permutation, uh, apply teleportation measurements. And in that way, this qubit that he wants to correct, you know, he wants to correct will be teleported through this, uh, you know, past all these EPR pairs, depending on, uh, you know, depending on what, what he does. And of course, importantly, just to, to stress, the path that this qubit will take will go past this inverse phase gate if a correction needs to be applied, and it will avoid it if no correction needs to be applied. Uh, and then, uh, well, then, of course, all these teleportations uh, also incur some teleportation corrections, right? If we apply, you know, if we teleport a qubit, then, uh, then as part of this teleportation, you apply a random Pauli to this qubit. But luckily, applying a random Pauli to a qubit just works very nicely with this quantum one-time pad. So uh, we can now just use the the information that Alice sent earlier about the structure of the gadgets, encrypted, uh, together with the outcomes that the server had, you know, and together, uh, you know, after so she, the, the, the cloud computer can first apply all these teleportation measurements, and then you know, input these teleportation measurements into another big classical uh, homomorphic computation and get back the new key. And now we're actually back to our invariant that we wanted to get back to. So if there was a phase get presence, it's gone. And now we have this, you know, the situation again that we can continue our computation. All right, just a few words to get some intuition about uh, why is this secure. So, well, all quantum information that we, that we send is encrypted with a quantum wanting pad. And the quantum wanting pad is perfectly secure. It's, it's like a very easy calculation. Uh, if the classical info is completely hidden. Well, but you might think, what happens with these, you know, these EPR pairs that Alice has constructed? You know, may, maybe these tell something about, you know, about the choices Alice made while constructing them. So actually, Alice doesn't really send EPR pairs, but she's going to pick one of the four Bell states at random and sends those along instead. And that is enough to hide the structure completely as long as the choice that she made, you know, which of the four Bell states she picked is completely hidden. But now, all classical information that I mentioned here will all be sent using the classical homomorphic encryption scheme. And just, uh, so now if the classical homomorphic encryption scheme is secure, then this scheme is also secure. So we actually don't need any other assumptions, but we just lean completely on the security of the classical homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, well, or maybe to be a bit, bit more precise, I guess we lean on the security of the classical homomorphic encryption scheme against quantum attackers. But you know, if we if we do this, then quantum attackers exist anyway. So that's so that's fine. Now, and just a quick overview. So how does the scheme, how does the scheme work in total? So the key generation is the, first we just generate the classical keys, and then Alice also generates a bunch of gadgets, depending on how many computations the cloud should be able to perform. Uh, the encryption is just applying the quantum one-time pad as before, and then uh, classically encrypting the path keys. The evaluation procedure, so after, after applying a Clifford gate, we just do the exact same thing as the Clifford scheme. We just update the, the keys of the one-time pad. But after applying a T-gate, we, we use this gadget to correct all the stuff. And then actually, the, after, after everything has been done, the, the state is still in the same kind of form that we started with. So decryption is just, just decrypt the key of the one, you know, use classical decryption to get the key back for the, one -time, for the quantum state, and then decrypt the quantum state. So, you know, what, what might you use such a scheme for? Well, of course, I hope that there will be more applications soon, but just as a first, uh, first start. So, delegated, so this scheme already performs delegated quantum computation in only two rounds. So, uh, so delegated quantum computation is kind of a related field where 
uh, where you want a protocol where you can talk back and forth with the server and uh, let the server co uh, compute something for you. Well, this, you can also view this as a protocol for delegated com computation, which is very round efficient. Uh, and it also has the, the extra, uh, well, sometimes good property that the, that the server doesn't even have to tell the client what he's doing. So he can just, the server now picks the, picks the algorithm. So it's nice that, so it's not ideal, of course, that we have to generate these gadgets, but it's at least nice that we can generate them on demand. So if the server says, oh, please give me some more, I want to be, a, be able to continue my, my computation, then Alice can just generate more. And actually, the, the computations that Alice has to do to generate them are not so hard. So all Alice has to be able to do is generate EPR pairs or Bell states and send them off. So she doesn't need any quantum memory. She doesn't need to do any other operations, just generating pairs of qubits and sending them off. Uh, so, right, so, uh, so one good property, if you work a little bit more, it's very easy to make an extension of the scheme which also has circuit privacy. So that means that, that after Alice does her encryption, she has no way of knowing at all what, what computation was applied to it, except, of course, you know, what the output of that computation was. So, you know, what's next? What can we do now to, to extend the scheme? So, of course, the most obvious thing is, this is, so we call this leveled quantum fully homomorphic encryption because at, uh, at key generation time, or at least at encrypt time, we have to pick the amount of the, an upper bound to the computation size. So even though this upper bound is a polynomial size circuit, uh, it would, would be nicer if, if you don't have an upper bound at all. Uh, so the ne another good next step would be to add verification. So now, uh, of course, part of homomorphic encryption is that the, the cloud computer has some choice in what, what computation to apply. He doesn't have to tell Alice what he's going to do beforehand. But for some applications, it might be very nice if afterwards the server can prove that, that he did a certain thing. Uh, and in the classical case, uh, homomorphic encryption is, is a key ingredient in building obfuscation, which is another cryptographic primitive. So uh, it's a very natural thing to try to build quantum, uh, quantum obfuscation, obfuscation of quantum circuits. Now, now we, that we have a scheme uh, of homomorphic encryption and see whether the techniques of the classical world also translate to the quantum world in this case. Uh, and that was it, thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. Please touch your floor as much as possible. Go ahead. Thank you. So classical homomorphic schemes are malleable by definition. What about your quantum scheme? Um, so yeah, I guess they, they're also, I mean, like I guess this is also by definition malleable. It's like, uh, I mean, the, the thing that you want actually is that, that someone else is able to change your, your data. So I, I think it should be the same here. Um, although this verification might, might change it a little bit, right? So, um, well, I guess, I guess I'm not entirely sure what it means to have a non-malleable homomorphic encryption scheme because the homomorphic part really means that you want something else to to perform a computation. So uh, I actually have two questions. So the first one, I'm sorry if you said this, the assumption is that the cloud has to follow the protocol or can he deviate from the protocol? Well, he can, the security, so the security in the sense of privacy of the yeah. data still holds if the cloud deviates from the protocol. So okay. all we say is that, so, Right, the cloud is not even really a part of the security definition. It's just Alice encrypts the stuff, and then you just have this, this you know, bunch of quantum data and classical data. 
and then you know anyone who sees this bunch of data should it should be secure against anyone who sees this, including the cloud, because the cloud doesn't know anything more than, than any observer at all. So, and then the second question was, um, so if I'm understanding correctly, uh, Alice has to know kind of what the classical encryption of the key is in order to do this gadget? Yes. And then, so, well, so um, know, knows what it will be at the time that this, this gadget is, is performed? Well she, she, well, she doesn't really know the encryption of the... So the person who generates the gadget needs to know the, the key of the classical scheme. Is, maybe right. that's what you mean? Yeah, but, but, that, but that kind of changes, I mean... But it, needs, she, it, seem, it seemed to me, I mean, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, sure. which I might not have, that um, she needed to know actually the ciphertext Okay, no, so she doesn't need to know the cipher. I mean, of course, they need to know the length of the ciphertext. But so this, this branching program, say, ultimately depends on things Alice knows and things the cloud knows. So Alice, and, uh, you know, to construct this branching program, you don't need to know the, the con you know, you don't need to know the ciphertext at all. Like, you need to know the ciphertext to, to then run it and know, you know, do I apply this permutation or the other one? But to construct, to come up with this list of instructions, you, I guess all you need to know is like the key length. But you don't need to know the, uh, the ciphertext yet. Uh, you only need to know the ciphertext to use it and the cloud knows the ciphertext, so he uses those. Oh, yeah. But, and then, but then she creates her gadget so that kind of all of the encryptions of the zero do one thing and all of the encryptions of the one do the other? Um, yes, basi basically yes. So right, it, it, whenever, whenever you use this gadget with an encryption of zero, but it might, you know, this encryption of zero might have some randomness in it. For example, there might be lots of encryptions of zero. Then all of them will, uh, you know, well, encryptions of zero actually then it will not do anything with the qubits, and if it's an encryption of one, it will apply to space gates. Any other questions? No. So, uh, so Alice has to send a number of EPR pairs based on her key, right? Yes. Um, but what, what happens, is the scheme robust to errors on Alice's side in those EPR pairs, right? Do those EPR pairs have to be perfect, or can the scheme account for errors on Alice's side? Uh, Right, that's a good question. Uh, so, well, I mean, if it's like tiny errors, of course, it, it should be reversed to tiny errors. But actually, it is the case that, say, if one of the EPR pairs is not an EPR pair at all, but uh, you know, perhaps just two qubits in a product state, then you know, with probability one fifth, I guess, because you know, it might not the path might not encounter that one. But if the path goes through that one, you will probably, you know, this will break. So, uh, so actually, the, the scheme like this is not is not that robust to sending. You know, if if Alice messes up at sending an EPR pair, I guess it might be still possible to put error correction on top of it, like you can put error correction on top of any uh, computation. Uh, just, I have a one quick question related to this. So about the error on the EPR pairs, does that only affect the correctness or is there any effect on the security as well? Uh, well, if this, okay, so what Alice sends should be completely, I mean, it should look completely mixed against someone who doesn't know the information. So, well, I mean, it depends on what you mean with an error then, right? Of course, if the error is accidentally sent, you sent my key over then, so if, but if the error is independent of the, of this key, of the classical data, then that should be fine. So then there's no problem there. Um, how does this scheme, hi, yeah. how does this scheme compare to the blind quantum computation schemes of uh, broadband Fitzsimmons and Kashefi? Uh, right, so the, the blind, the task in blind computation is a, is a bit different. Because in the, I guess in the blind computation case, then Alice is the one that chooses what to do. 
and uh, so it chooses the computation. And now we're talking about the case where, where the cloud is the one that knows the program that he wants to apply. So that makes it makes it different. And also there, I think that usually the blind computation schemes have some some way of interacting. So it's like an interactive protocol, but in our case, it's just you know encrypt, send it off, and then eventually you get back back what you want. So that might might sometimes be easier if you want to use it as a, as a primitive to build something else. So uh, just a quick comment to um, repeat what. Uh, Florian was answering about the noise issue. Um, so I think what you need to do is just to perform the homomorphic uh, computation on the um, air correctance, air corrected circuit. So there is noise, you do the um, air correction on the noise uh, regularly, and then there is this new circuit that is simulating, um, the using noisy gates to simulate the noise, noiseless circuit. Then you perform the entire for torrent circuit uh, with the homomorphic encryption, then I think all the problem will be resolved. Okay, thank you. Any other question? How does Alice determine how many gadgets she needs to construct? Right, so, okay, so this is why it's not, you know, this was like the first point of my future work, right? It's not, uh, there's this level to quantify, so it's like, uh, so I guess it depends on the on the application. So sometimes, when you use it as a primitive for something else, you might actually have a good upper bound to the the size, the polynomial size circuit you want to perform. But uh, but in general, I guess it depends on the application. And sometimes, so you don't necessarily need to construct them while encrypting. So you might if if you have a setting where interactive protocols are fine. Which is the case for some, you know, for some cloud computing applications. Then she might have also construct them on demand. The server just says, "Okay, you know, my computation will take a bit longer than than expected. Just give me some some more of these these EPR pairs that I can use to continue." So possibly, I, maybe I just missed this, but you, so you said the security of this rests on the security of the classical homomorphic yep. uh, scheme. And, but uh, in the table, in the overview, you said that you had com um, information theoretic security, or did I get that wrong? Or is it oh, computational? No. Oh, I, I, if, if, it, if it was there, it shouldn't be. It should have said, I mean, I think it said computational. Okay, then it I just doesn't, it was a mistake. Like, okay. it rests on the computational security of the other scheme. Okay, so then my follow-up question, can you use the, um, so there was a result by Fitzsimons et al. where they managed to get information theoretic security. Is there any hope of boosting to information theoretic security using those techniques? Uh, I don't think so because I think it's actually. So I think that also. Uh, um, no, I don't think so. I think there are information theoretic security for for general size circuits will be will be very hard and it doesn't scale directly here. Like actually, we we do put some work, some actual work in this classical homomorphic encryption scheme. It's not that trivial what they do. Okay. And, I, and it is known also that um, that information theoretic classical homomorphic encryption schemes do not exist in general. So you know we we cannot say we hope that someday one of those will be found and then we can plug it in. I think we can take one last quick question. Well, if there isn't any, let's thank our speaker again. And